we look at part two of what I call inheritance. Inheritance. I'm just going to do a quick recap for those of us that were not here last week on what we mean by inheritance. The idea of inheritance is that somebody has worked for something, another person comes to have it. That's a simple way to put it. Somebody has worked for something, another person who did not do the work, but by virtue of sonship, by virtue of being the child of the person that worked, right? He just comes in and comes to take advantage, to enjoy what he did not work for. And sometimes people may say, oh, but that's not fair. Yeah, it's not fair, but it's favor. It's the way it works. That's the way it is. Look at Acts of Apostles chapter 20 verse 32. That's our anchor scripture. Acts of Apostles chapter 20 verse 32. He said, now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So in this scripture last week I mentioned, that if you pay attention, you will see what the Bible says. He said, I commit you to God and to the word of his grace. So grace comes in. And I said, there is the word of his law, which is different from the word of his grace. In the word of his grace, grace is activated. And grace is essentially, you know, your father walked. You just enjoy this property. It doesn't make sense. If there are other people around you who do not have fathers who left them inheritance, they will get jealous of them. They will be like, what well, she's... I mean, and sometimes if you look at families, people who have great estates, sometimes maybe they will even have a nasty child that is not so great. But it doesn't change the fact that he is a child of the father. And the father will still be queen to that child, his estate. That's grace. It has nothing to do with what you did or what you did not do. It has everything to do with who you are. You are a child of the person that owns the property. And you know where I come from, there is one interesting proverb that says you cannot say because your, your child's bum bum is B, you not take the B and put it on another child's bum bum. <laughs> it's not possible. Your child is your child. Family comes in here. You know, the Bible says a good man leaves inheritance for his children's children. So it means that sometimes even he does not know his children's children, the children's children are, are not yet born, but they've been provided for. Can you imagine that? That some people are actually so wealthy that they have made provisions for children that are yet unborn. Praise God. They have made provisions for children that are not yet born. That's what I'm talking about. Welcome, sir. Is make and I mean made a provision for you in Christ. That's the concept of inheritance. And you see, except you understand this message of grace, you're not going to be able to appropriate all that God has provided for us. It's good to see. <laughs> pleasant, pleasant surprise. Praise God. <laughs> so the Bible says, I commit you to God and to the word of his grace. And I did mention last week that, see, the average believer has been so bastardized with the word of his law that is, it is difficult for him to now embrace the word of his grace. You know, somebody, let's imagine an adoption process. Somebody has, has grown up in the ghetto, used to malnourishment, abuse. His mindset is already conditioned to poverty. Now, a big man rises up from a high bro area of that city and besides one day that I want to be a blessing, you know, there is a way you are so fed, you are so rich, you want to be a blessing, he just says, go get me 10 children from the ghetto, I want to adopt them and then they are adopted right, they, by the law of adoption, the moment you are adopted you begin to answer my name, that's why all of what God has done for us is in the name of Jesus is the adoption process now the moment you are adopted, the law sees you as my child and it does not matter that I was not the one that gave back to you biologically. You answer my name. Under the law, you have access to everything that I have access to that is mine. It's now your inheritance. But you see, the problem is that this guy has been so long in the ghetto and his mind is conditioned to the ghetto. 
So you see, he, he, the things that are ordinarily ease is going to be difficult for him to take it. The problem is not what we have been given, it is what we are not taking. We've been given so much, but because our minds have not been transformed by the word of God, we will take so little. So sometimes even God is concerned that you're wasting his grace. You're wasting his grace. You're not taking advantage of his grace. I commend you to God. I commit you to God and to the word of his grace. What is it able to do? It is able to build you up. You first need to be built up before you can take your inheritance. A child that is immature does not understand his inheritance. And you see, in our physical life, it is not so much about how old you are. I have met people who are old but cannot relate with their father as sons. And I've met younger people who are matured enough and can take advantage of their position as sons and actually enjoy the blessings of their father. You know, I just woke up one day, I think I was 16, and I told myself, my father's wardrobe is a beautiful place to be old. The only problem I had was that he was so tall that I couldn't fit into his clothes. So I went there one day and I opened the door of that wardrobe. I said, okay, I can't use his, all his clothes, suits, shirts, they were bigger. But I could fit into his shoes. Interestingly, if I need to add it a little bit, but I can fit it. Then I looked at it, his car, I could use it, said good, makes two. What's the thought in? I found out that he had so many ties and I could use them. I didn't get permission. There is, is an awareness. I couldn't do that two years ago. But you see, there is something about maturity. You know, Paul said, when I was a child, I, I, I talked as a child, as, there is a way a child thinks, there is a way a son thinks. When you are built up, the, there is a difference between somebody that is begging God, please heal me, and somebody who rises up and says, I am healed. The difference is that one has been built up to understand the word of his grace and is now taking his inheritance. The scripture we are considering is Acts chapter 20 verse 32. He's been built up and he can now stand up. There is what I call the audacity of a child when he's mature. It's an audacity of faith that you now say, this belongs to me. This is my father's property and I can make use of it. And we're going to look into a story this morning that actually paints that picture. So, God has an inheritance strategy, and I read through my scriptures, my Bible, I found out that this doctrine of inheritance is from Genesis to Revelation. Did you notice that it was not Adam that planted Eden? Are you aware? It was not Adam. Eden was planted before Adam was created. And God so much did it that everything was complete. All that Adam needed for life and for godliness had been planted in Eden before Adam woke up. So he just woke up as a, but you see the, the issue was that he woke up as a son. He woke up as a son and became conscious of the fact that all he needed for life, for godliness, everything was present in the garden. That's exactly the same thing that Jesus did for us in the New Testament. He went to the cross, paid the price. And he's just saying to us, guys, enter into what I have prepared for you. It's a prepared blessing. The healing has been done. The blessing has been done. So this was what Paul came to the realization when Paul says, Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who acts. It's not that he will. Because you see, many times if you don't get this, you come to God with the sense of, I know you did not contemplate this my problem, but now the problem has come. So you have to do something. Say, Lord, do no, no, no. It's not trying to do something. Your, your, your case is, you've got to find out what has been done and go back in and take advantage of it. Somebody gets what I'm talking about. It's not going to be done. It has been done. This meal is cooked. And God just wants you to understand first that this has been done, it's been settled in Christ, and then we step into it. So, I said one thing that is very critical that we mentioned last week is the fact that you need to come to the realization of who you are first. And because, you see, sometimes we raise people in church and the identity we give them is the identity of a church member. 
And in this world now, you have all kinds of things. This one says I'm Catholic, the other one says I'm Anglican, the other one says I'm Methodical. The other... That's not the point. The point is that you are a citizen of the kingdom. You are a child of God. Yeah, everybody is trying to build his empire and churchify you so there is a name, beautiful. But we, we are building an identity of, oh, somebody says I'm redeemed. No, the question is, are you redeemed? Another one says, I am a member of deep life. No, the question is, are you deep? Are you deep? The death of God, the man that founded deep life, it was out of his death of God that he brought out that thing. The other one says, I'm a member of, of covenant. Yes, do you understand the covenant? Those are the critical matters. Do you understand the covenant? I'm a member of winners. Are you a winner? <laughs> because it's easy for you to say you're a winner, and yet the devil is trampling upon you. Are you a winner? Do you understand that Jesus has conquered for you? And that you are a part of that victory that Jesus won? That's what is important. So we said, understanding that you are not just a child, because when you read the scriptures, we read a couple of scriptures last week, that went a step further to say, we are not just children, we are heirs. We are not just children, we are heirs. Look at Galatians chapter 4 verse 7 for instance. Galatians chapter 4 verse 7. This scripture of Paul to the Galatian church actually helps us to understand our transition that we are no more servants. Look at it. Galatians chapter 4 verse 7. I'm reading the KJ. He said, wherefore, Thou art no more a servant. Somebody say to yourself, say, I'm no more a servant. No but a son. a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Complete scripture. Because you see, in the Old Testament, we are servants of God. The only person really that the Bible captures as the son of God in the Old Testament was the first Adam. And Adam, the son of God. Every other person in the Old Testament, the highest they attained to was friend of God. That was Abraham. Perhaps Enoch. The Bible says Enoch walked with God. For you to walk with somebody, right? There is a sort of friendship. But every other person was a servant of God. There were dimensions of God that they could not enter into because, you see, no matter how close some of us have had parents who are servants, and some of us have had, you have those servants that were actually nice, very good guy or girl. But you see, there is always a limit. In my own house, no matter how good you are, you couldn't enter into my father's bedroom. My mom made that a standing rule. It was a no-go area. Nobody, it's only sons that can enter into that place. It's the secret place of the most high. <laughs> you can't enter. We had People help us who try, but you dare not. If my mom catches you, you are gone. That place is the exclusive prison of children. It's the arrow chamber, it's the inner court. Servants can get into that place. You can play in the sitting room, you can watch the TV, you, you have your own room, you have your own yard, but that place is the inner chamber. When we want to have serious discussions, that we don't want the people to, that's where we go to. Is the absolute rock of the family. <laughs> so there were things servants couldn't have access to. Yeah, you see, he was prophesying, but he's still a servant. And I said, he had a mighty work, he's still a servant. Now we are sons, praise God. He said, we're no more servants. You need to shift from a servant mentality to a son mentality. It makes all the difference. Your perspective of relating with God is going to change when you shift your mind from servant to son. And of course, when you read the New Testament, you will see people like Paul refer to themselves as servants of God. It's an addendum. The first thing is knowing yourself as a son of God. It's a dispensational shift. In the Old Testament, there were servants. In the New Testament, we are first sons. Yeah, we serve the purposes of God in that world. Sabbath now means you are a minister, not that you are a slave. The arcade word there is we are no longer slaves, we are sons. It makes all the difference. You see the same thing, Romans chapter 8, verse 17. He said, Now if we are children, then we are heirs. Because a lot of you, yeah, you've gotten the revelation that you are a child of God, but you still have not seen yourself as the heir of God. Praise God. 
It is too far fetched for you to think of yourself as somebody that has a legal standing to take advantage of all that God is. We are not just children, we are heirs, heirs of God and co heirs with Christ. Romans 8 17 says, If indeed we share in his sufferings, we will also share in his glory. You know, half truth is dangerous. There is nothing as tragic as somebody who knows a bit and does not know, he can in fact be poisonous. Sometimes it's better not to know than to know just a little. Have you seen somebody who knows how to start a car, engage the jet, and press the turtle, but does not know break? He's going to kill himself. Because what he knows is is good, but he's not good enough. He's going to kill himself without approval. So, in every chance, I said, it's a family strategy that is put in place so that children can have an advantage in this world. Children can have an advantage. There are ch- parents in Canada right now who have houses waiting for their children. There are people who have money as down payment for their children. See, on the day of your wedding, I just give it to you. So, there is a difference between a child that is positioned in that kind of a family and one that is like an orphan in this world, has no help. So, he has, have you, I've met people who are still paying educational loans that they use all through school. Meanwhile, some people entered life and just started enjoying, no debt to pay. It makes, the, it makes a whole lot of difference. Some children cannot actually say that they have enjoyed life because they entered into life struggling. There was nothing they met on, on the ground. The ground was dry. But inheritance is that advantage that wets the floor. That's how you can enter into the rest of God. You know, Adam was created on the sixth day. The Bible says on the seventh day, God rested. So the first major day that Adam woke up to was a rest. Why? Everything had been created for him. That's the place where the believer is supposed to live from. A place of advantage. It may not be in your physical account, but you must understand that it's in your spiritual account. And then as you begin to understand the word of God, by faith you can transfer out of the spirit realm into the physical realm. Oh, you say, I have a sickness in my body. But you see, your health is already in the spirit realm. You need faith to draw it out. It's an inheritance. You're not working for it. The business of the believer is using faith to draw from the account of the spirit and make it a reality upon the heart. But first and foremost, you must first understand that there is an inheritance. There is an inheritance. And the inheritance is for the sanctified. is for the justified. It's not for the unbeliever. Unfortunately, do you understand that it's possible that an unbeliever takes advantage of this and a believer does not take advantage of it? We saw in the scriptures people took advantage of healing who are not even saved. And up to today, some people are believing that, oh, it's because of this my weakness, that's why I'm not healed. No, you're wrong. It has nothing to do with what you do. It has everything to do with who you are. You are a child of God. And by that you have a right. Somebody say, I have a right. I have a right. You know, I said something last week and I want to repeat it today. It is wrong for you to have an entitlement mentality in the world. But in the word of God, it is good that you have an entitlement mentality. When you read something in the word of God and it says that is who you are, please develop an entitlement mentality around it. You need it. In fact, a strong one. Strong entitlement mentality. Such that when you go to God in prayer, you're, you're standing up to his face and say, but your word says. That's the kind of audacity that God wants you to have as a child. Say, Lord, you've got to prove this your word. You're not a liar. Your word says. Your word says, by your stripes I have been healed. Your word says, I have the righteousness of God in Christ. How is this a righteousness? How can sin be exercising dominion over me? When your word says, sin shall not have dominion, it will show you the clue that you are missing. You need to develop an entitlement mentality. So know there is an inheritance. Number two, know that you are an heir of God. In fact, this week, say it to yourself, I'm an heir of God. If the circumstances will want to tell you that you are not, 
But you've got to keep saying to yourself, I am an heir of God. I am an heir of God. I have a legal entitlement to everything that God has made available in Christ. Galatians 3.29 He said, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants. That's how we got connected to Abraham. Because the Bible says, God's covenant with Abraham was to Abraham and to his seed. Not his seed. And that seed was Christ. So everything that God settled in Abraham and Christ, we entered into it through Christ. We got the inheritance, the blessing. You see, it was not Ishmael that got it, it was Isaac. That's a child of promise. When you go down a little further, you will see the difference between Esau and Jacob. And maybe I should quickly talk to you a bit about Esau and Jacob. One was the first son and had entitlement to the blessing, the patriarchal blessing of his father. Have you considered the story recently of how Jacob entered into it? It was not by works, it was by grace. Because the Bible says the father called Esau and said, go get me the kind of food that I like. And this guy took his bow and his arrow went into the field. Right? He went on to like, I'm sure while he was in the bush, he, you know how you are preparing for something like, I'm getting that blessing today. But he has to be by labor. And so he was looking for the best animal in the bush. I'm going to keep the fattest one and cook something sumptuous. That's the way a lot of believers are, are behaving. We're trying, we're trying to do something to impress the father. Say, if, if I do 40 days fast, God will give me power. La la. There are people who have done 40 days fast and they came back dry. And you see, fasting in itself is good. But fasting with the mentality that it is a fasting that produces the power is wrong. You will miss it. That's works, not grace. Esau went out, sharp shooter. I'm sure he put on something. He was looking for the big, I'm going to kill him. Then there was this guy that was at home. And you see, grace is not, is not is not um, an accreditation for your responsibility. It's important to say that. But it is what it is. It is grace. Someone was in the field, right? Hunting everything on table. Somebody was at home, then the mother called him and said, Have you heard that your father wants to bless your brother today? He said, Yes, I have. So, what have I to do with that? He said, I will show you what to do. What somebody was looking for in the field, somebody had it at home. Already made. The mother made it, everything was ready. This guy was still sweating in the field. Some children need to stop sweating in the field and come home to enjoy the blessing that is in the backyard of their father. What the father was looking for was no longer in the field, it was at all. But the key to it was in the hands of the mother. The key to what you are looking for outside is in the hands of Jesus Christ. Do you see the picture? The key to your health, to your healing, to your prosperity, to your overcoming sin is not in your struggle, it's in the hands of Jesus. You just got to acknowledge this thing is in Jesus. That's why the Bible says, you know, we are praying at our prayer meeting this year, the Lord activated the future. It's not going to be by power or by might, but by my spirit, see the Lord. Grace is not work activated, it is faith activated. Now, the mother cooked it. Her brother was still struggling in the field. When it was time to go present it to the father, Jacob said, now we have a problem. My brother is airy, but I am smooth skin. You remember? He said, if I now go there, instead of attracting the blessing, let it not be that I now attract the curse. It's okay if I don't get the blessing, but don't let me get the curse. Now the point is, if you go to the Father carrying yourself, you are under the curse of the law. There is no way we, as we are, that we can be pleasing to the Lord by ourselves. There is no way. You know the methodology that the mother taught him? He said, we will put something on you that will make you... So he went in the court of Esau. He was still Jacob. Are you getting it? He was still Jacob. But he went in the court of his son. That's how we go to the Father in the name of Jesus. There are New Testament scriptures that talks about 
putting on the Christ. You've got to learn up. I mean, you are in the cold weather right now. You are putting on your jacket. The reason why you are not shivering right now is not because you are strong. It's because you've learned to wear the right apparel for the season. Am I correct? That's how the believer wears Christ. We wear Christ. The finished work of Christ. So they just needed to put the air on Jacob's skin. And for you to see, the, the interesting thing was that the father still recognized that this was the voice of Jacob. But he was... There was, there was something about this thing. He almost got the father crazy. I can hear the voice of Jacob, but, 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 this skin is confusing me. And you see, grace, the eyes of grace are short. Are you listening to me? This is how the Bible says, I will not remember your iniquity. There are some of you that have taught you that you need to go and pray to God and say, God, Remind me of every sin that I see, those that I can repent. You are, you are just being foolish. <laughs> God Himself said, I will no longer remember your iniquity. What are you talking about? The, the one that is supposed to judge you said, I'm not interested in your chat sheet. You are saying, Lord, please bring out my chat sheet oh, so that I can apologize. What are you talking about? He said, I'm not going to remember it. I'm not trying to. You are trying to prove a point to God. God says the sin has been paid for. Can you? You know some of us are very troublesome. Have you ever forgiven somebody and he still comes back saying, "Please forgive me"? I just I'm like, "Oh baby, I have forgiven you." What? What part of it is difficult that you don't understand? He said, "You know, I know what I did was wrong. You have been nobody righteous. You are proud. You have been forgiven." forgiveness and you embrace the finished work of Christ and move on to better things in God. The reason why some people have not grown up to maturity is because they are still grappling with you. Am I, you are being forgiven. You know what? How many times did you give your life to Christ? <laughs> how many of you know what I'm talking about? Some of us, we gave our life to Christ over and over and over and over and over again. I'm sure even Jesus God died like... <laughs> What will you do that you are saved once and for all? It was a complete work that Jesus did. And I, in my own case, I found out that until I had an assurance of my salvation, I couldn't move on to better things. I couldn't move on. I couldn't move on. You just keep on moving around that mountain. And at some point, you've got to say to yourself, you have moved around this mountain long enough. Take your journey northward. Take your journey northward. So he was confused that the eyes of grace were short. And the father said, It is the voice of Jacob, but the skin is the skin of Esau. Would you not have thought that the right thing to do in the circumstance was to hold on? Right? It would have made a lot of sense. Since there is a confusion on the ground. I'm not sure whether this is Jacob or whether this is Esau. And I mean, I have a Esau personality, but I'm getting a Jacob vibe. I mean, vibe. Then I'll just wait. Let's clarify this thing. But the father did not wait. Thank God that God is not waiting for you to get it all right. Have you ever imagined if God was waiting for us until we are perfect? How long do you think he will wait? Forever? Because we will never be perfect. God is not waiting for you to, you know, some people are still saying, Lord, uh, I just wait for me. I will get it right. When? <laughs> In 2042, you will still not have been perfect. Say, I just want to wait until that time when I'm able to pray five hours a day. I, I just want to wait until that year when I'm able to say 365 days of this year, I did my devotion right. Each. You are, you are deceiving yourself. <laughs> You are deceiving yourself. If God was going to wait until you got all your stuff together, you will not make this trip. 